Hey, good evening. Thank you for joining us on the Political Deep Dive uh, this week. My name is David Valente. Uh, we are back on Facebook. Uh, we have survived our 30-day stint in the sin bin for our Jeffrey Dahmer post uh, over Thanksgiving. So uh, good to be back. We're also uh, still, in fact, uh, you're joining us. You could be on joining us on the Political Deep Dive podcast uh, Facebook group. Uh, you could be on our YouTube or Twitter at Papa Duke. Uh, Twitch. We also are on at DT Valente. Um, we also have an Instagram uh, that we're going to get more involved with uh, that we just started uh, a couple weeks ago. So that is the political deep dive on Instagram. And of course, tomorrow you can pick up the podcast of this episode uh, on uh, SoundCloud at the political deep dive. Um, I do have to thank the people for Liberty uh, for hosting this pod uh, for this uh, show during my uh, Facebook jail, uh, Dan Fishman and, and the great people at People for Liberty, uh, thank you so much for, for offering us a platform while we were uh, facing that ban. Um, and I can't thank you enough. Uh, please go to peopleforliberty.org or the uh, Facebook page, which is the People Number 4 Liberty Inc. Um, it's a great organization. It plugs you into uh, great liberty organizations throughout the country or throughout social media. And then uh, for content creators, it gives uh, tips and help and all that good stuff. So uh, thanks to the People for Liberty. And then finally, oops, let me remove that. And then finally, uh, so this is my last week as chairman of the Libertarian Party of West Virginia. And uh, I want to invite everyone to the 2021 LPWV annual meeting. Uh, it's going to be April 17th at the Holiday Inn Express in Bridgeport, West Virginia. Uh, we're going to have a great keynote address by Terry and Matt Kibbe from Free the People. And we're going to have candidate training by Erica and Carl Klinich, both of whom have run statewide campaigns in West Virginia. So it'll be a great opportunity to get some training here, a great keynote address, and it's only $5. So if you're in West Virginia or uh, any of the surrounding states and want to come and see a great presentation, uh, come on out to the uh, Libertarian Party West Virginia annual, annual meeting uh, Saturday at the Holiday Inn Express in Bridgeport. We're also having an, uh, an event uh, the night before, uh, it's on our Facebook page. It's uh, it's mixing alcohol and throwing axes. So I, I don't know how well that's going to go, but uh, uh, Will Hyman's organizing that. And uh, if you want to get involved, uh, feel free. So uh, tonight, I'm very excited because we uh, have a great guest this evening. Uh, we're going to be talking about criminal justice reform. And, and my guest is former Liber Libertarian uh, Party Chairman Nicholas Sarwark. Uh, he now works with the Libertarian Policy Institute, and let me bring him on. Mr. Sarwark, how are you doing, sir? I'm great, David. How are you? Great, man. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for joining us tonight, and uh, let's uh, let's get into it. Um, let's talk about, let, let's go ahead and introduce yourself. I know that most of the people watching this will know who you are and are intimately familiar with your, uh, with your work, but uh, let, let's, uh, let's get an introduction here. Let's imagine you didn't know me already. Um, <laughs> I'm Nicholas Sarwark. I am currently executive director of the Libertarian Policy Institute. I'm also an attorney. I spent five years as a public defender in Colorado, uh, arguing over 36 cases to a jury, uh, including arguments before the Colorado Supreme Court on some appellate issues. And um, I also was chairman of the Libertarian National Committee from 2014 until last year in 2020. And so that's kind of my background. I live in Manchester, New Hampshire with my wife, Valerie, and our four children. And um, I'm a big fan of the Capitals, who are a better hockey team than the Sabres. Man, you had to go there. Dang, <laughs> man. I invited you on and you had to go. Yeah, that's fine. That's, that's accurate. They, will, they beat him the other night. Facts so. don't care about your feelings, Dave. I, you only <laughs> care about facts. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so uh, you are single-handedly growing the libertarian movement for children, um, and uh, you are now, uh-oh, uh uh-oh, Will Hyman, he says, oof, Caps fan. <laughs> <laughs> Haters gonna hate. Yeah, yeah. But uh, so you you uh, moved to New Hampshire, uh, you, you've, you're taking part in the, the Free State Project. Uh, how's that going? It's pretty good. Uh, the Free State Project, for those who don't know, it was started by Jason Sorens back in the early 2000s, I want to say 2000 or 2001, 
was a doctoral thesis of his that, you know, you could concentrate libertarians in a single state. And if the state was the type of state that was small enough and culturally receptive enough that you could have outsized success. And it, it taps back into things like the, the 3% movement, not the militant side of it, but the idea that it really does just take an itinerant minority to cause political change. So maybe an itinerant minority like the libertarian should be in a smaller state. Uh, I signed up back in, I think, 01 or 02. Uh, my signer number was in the low 400s. And uh, now they have over 20,000 people who have signed up. I believe there's almost 5,000 who have actually moved to New Hampshire. And it's a mixed bag. You know, we have some successes, we have some failures. Uh, a lot of things have changed to go better, and some things are still a work. So, it's also a great place to live. So it wasn't that hard to follow through with my commitment back in 2019, where, you know, we have four small children. This is one of the lowest crime states in the country. There are basically no taxes other than property tax. Um, there's no sales tax. There's no income tax. They don't have helmet laws or seatbelt laws or mandatory insurance. But it's also a really nice place to live. It doesn't turn into what people would think of a place that has a lot of freedom. You know, there's no Somalia kind of comparisons up here. Yeah. Yeah, it's not Somalia. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about what we brought you on to talk about tonight. Criminal justice reform. So uh, you were a public defender in Colorado. Um, what was, talk about the worst of the um, transgressions of the state when it comes to the criminal justice uh realm and in, in, as being a public defender? So the worst trans, the most important transgressions are not the worst ones, right? So my office handled the James Holmes case. Um, I wasn't on that case, but that was a very serious case where the prosecutor sought the death penalty. Um, and the things that were done in that case, some of them are part of bad prosecution or failure to really be responsive to victims unless the victims align with your personal political goals. There are some problems at that top end of the criminal justice system. But what I experienced in Colorado that really gave me a sense of where we need to fix things in criminal justice reform are the things at the bottom end, you know, the, the, the top of the funnel, if you think in marketing terms of how you get people into the system, not so much what happens to them at the end, and so in Colorado, for example, at least when I was practicing law, if you took a left turn and you didn't go into the closest lane to the divided line after you made the left turn, if you went into the right hand lane as though you were going to turn into the bank or the Taco Bell or whatever, that's a traffic infraction. And that traffic infraction is disproportionately enforced to stop and attempt to contact in an attempt to find other criminal activity, primarily people of color. Um, it's not something that tends to be enforced in more affluent or uh, wider areas. It's something that tends to be enforced in areas that are considered to be high crime, majority minority. They find technical infractions to start the police contact. And then once the police contact is started, then there's a panoply of ways that you can go from there, from, hey, it looks like you didn't pay a traffic ticket from two years ago, we have to arrest you now, to, hey, um, I was just wondering where you're going, can I take a look in your car and poke around to see if there's anything you have you shouldn't have, to, you know, why don't you wait here by the side of the road until I could get a dog to come out with a canine unit, sniff your car. Those kind of things create a culture where you have this separation between the law enforcement officers and the community that they protect. Yeah. You know, it's not a member of the community who's taken on this profession in order to protect everyone else in the community. It's very much a sense of there's an us and there's a them. And people really know whether or not they're on the us or them side of it. Um, that is the big problem in criminal justice in the United States. The fact that police refer to people as civilians 
when in fact no law enforcement agency is outside of civilian control. Nobody here is militarized. We have the posse comitatus for that. Mm -hmm. But there has been a cultural shift within policing in the United States for police officers and law enforcement members to see themselves as something other and or above the rest of the community. There's this sheepdog mentality. There's the, you know, somebody needs to protect the people from themselves. There's a lot of envy for the military services, um, which I have found ironic have, coming from a military family myself, that the rules of engagement for use of force in the military are actually much more restricted oh, yeah. than the ones under, say, qualified immunity and law enforcement training practices. So there's a lot of stuff and it does go at that lower level of how policing is done. That's where the real work needs to be done not to say that any of the big high profile things aren't problems. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about, so you, when you were in college, you worked for the Institute for Justice, right? Uh, yeah. So it was one of the summers while I was in law school, I clerked for the Institute for Justice. I got to work with Clark Neely and um, Scott Bullock and all the good people over there on some really neat libertarian public interest cases. Okay. I uh, don't know what that means. Cool. Uh, so um, uh, tell me what your experience working with IJ taught you. So IJ taught me sort of how to do public interest litigation. I mean, I went to law school because of IJ. Their work fighting against some um, nasty property developer from Queens who was trying to steal a little old lady's house in Atlantic City. Mm -hmm. um, I heard that that guy may have gone on to do some other things later in his life. Yeah. Nothing of note. Um, that's what got me to go to law school. And their work inspired me to see law as a way to fight against the government, beating up on the little guy. But what I learned clerking there was this concept of being a happy warrior, of looking at the case as, you know, as a libertarian in the legal world. Uh, as IJ is, there are various standards of review that are stacked against you from the jump, right? Rational yeah. basis review, which is how most economic liberty restrictions are reviewed in the courts, basically says, if a judge can come up with a reason why they might have wanted to possibly have had a rational reason to make this law, then as long as he can come up with that creative reason, the law is upheld as constitutional. So that's where you get ridiculous broccoli style hypotheticals. Yes. What IJ did with that was they, they took it and they said, look, we're not supposed to win any of these cases, right? The deck's already stacked. The refs are, are working us. We're, we're hometowned all the time. So they look at the philosophy of litigation as we're trying very hard to win. We're fighting in the court of law, but also in the court of public opinion. That's the whole public interest litigation thing where you get people to tell their stories instead of having the lawyers just speak for them. And if we win, we're going to celebrate, right? We're going to crow about it because that wasn't supposed to happen. And if we don't win, we're not going to get that down because the system was already rigged, so what do you expect? We're not gonna take that as the kind of loss that you would take if you were playing on an even playing field. Yeah, And that philosophy was something I brought to my practice as a public defender. It's something I brought to the Libertarian National Committee when I was chairman, that we needed to bring that happy warrior philosophy where we fight really hard but we don't get down on ourselves about losses that were not within our control. Um, and it, it resonated really with my sort of stoic outlook on the world that yeah. we focus really intently on the things we can change. And we try to not get too emotionally attached to stuff that's going to happen regardless of what we do. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about your stoicism uh, a little bit later. I, uh, I want to ask, 
Looking at the criminal justice system, and I know that you were talking about the unequal application of the laws when you were working in, in Denver. What, so what is wrong with the American uh, criminal justice system right now? I mean, it had good bones, uh, you know, presumption of innocence, uh, you know, due process, right to speedy and fair trial, uh, no and cruel and unusual punishments. Where has it gone wrong? So it's going to get deep and philosophical, but sure. the show title said deep dive. So That's right. I'm accepting that as permission to do this thing. This country was founded by people who were, if you buy into critical race theory, which I don't necessarily losers or people who were otherwise ostracized or othered from somewhere else, right? The people who came to the colonies didn't fit in in the places that they were before. That's generally accepted. There's nothing political about that. This was a new frontier to go settle because they didn't fit in where they were before. Because of that, the Declaration of Independence and Constitution have very strong protections for minorities, for people who are misfits, outcasts, the other, the lesser, right? Outside of the Three-Fifths Compromise, most of our founding document, documents are very individualistic and very skeptical of sort of institutional power, right? This was an attempt to have an individualist pro-liberty, um, you know, as long as you're a good neighbor, kind of a la John Stuart Mill. And it was an experiment on the face of the earth. The problem that we have run into is that populism is a natural mode for human beings to fall into, where there is an in-group and then there's some minority out-group that is the problem. Their existence is the problem, their competition with our workers is the problem, their silly languages or their food or their skin color or whatever, that's a problem. They're messing up the thing that we've got. We don't want these misfits here. And so over time, we've fallen into that as a country where by turns, there's always been an other. It's either been the Chinese or the Jews or the blacks or you know, the Italians or the Irish or the Germans, you know, you just over and over and over again, it's always there's somebody coming in um, and they're going to mess this thing up that we call America, notwithstanding the irony of the fact that America was started by a bunch of people who messed up the thing that other people had in Europe. And that instinct has sort of been transformed as we've evolved on things like ethnicity and religion and race, right? Those are no longer acceptable bigotries. They were transformed into a form that was still useful. And you go back to Nixon starting the war on drugs, they couldn't go after the blacks and the hippies, but they could go after people who smoked marijuana who happened to overlap very tightly on the Venn diagram with the people they weren't allowed to target anymore. So there you get the war on drugs. Um, immigration and immigration restrictionism is the same sort of thing where you have a rough proxy for people who come from south of the border, but you don't get to call them out by their ethnic groupings because that's not acceptable. Um, I think you see it a lot in why transgenderism is such a hot topic in politics is because it's seen as one of the acceptable bigotries that's left. And there's a, almost a sense of wanting to fight for it. But any kind of criminal underclass, that was a way to put people who didn't fit in into a box where you could say, look, they committed a crime, they forfeited their rights to have a place to fit in. They're lucky that we even let them out of jail at all. And so what this usually is, is an inability to integrate some other group into the broader society or an unwillingness or just not wanting to. And where do we put those people? Well, we've got all these, the system of prisons and these people that work in prisons and these people that put people into court to go to prison. We've got all this, these tools. 
we just need some sort of raw material for this machine that we have. Let's pass a law that, you know, if you send a dirty picture to somebody and it's the wrong kind of dirty picture, we can put you in prison. Well, now that'll capture a bunch more people. We'll have a bunch of people going to find those dirty picture senders. And there we go. Now, Bob's your uncle. And that is the root cause that really has to be dealt with, right? We can fight on things like cash bail and qualified immunity and ending the racist war on drugs and cannabis legalization as a step towards that. Those are all useful. But what we have to understand is that if we don't find a way to integrate those people into society where they also have a voice, the natural tendency for populism to pop up is going to find something that those people or a different subgroup of people could be different this time, but somebody's going to have to be put in the cages because otherwise we wouldn't have to run the cages. And then what would all those cage runners do? They would have to go in the cage. Get real jobs. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. It, um, so this is, I mean, beneficial jobs, I should say. Their jobs are definitely real. They're just doing something that I'm not sure is on net good for society. Exactly. Um, so this goes way deeper than if we just pass this law or this, uh, we roll back this, roll back that. It, it's a much deeper conversation. And we, we need to figure out how to integrate folks into the society rather than yeah, we do need to reform laws. I know that there are right. many laws we need to get off the books. I mean, we can't even count the number of laws that are on the books right now. So people with good jobs who are running companies who are integrated in society don't brush up on the criminal justice system that often. Right. Yeah. And so a lot of people take that and they start correlating it and they get into this weird Calvinist morality of. Well, if you have a good job and you make a lot of money or you're integrated in society, that means you're a good person. And if you don't have those things, that means you're somehow a suspect moral character. And it's a correlation. It's not a causation. Yes. Right. The, the, you have to allow, you have to provide the path for people to reach that state in order to really have any sort of moral attachment to whether or not you get it, especially if there are people who get to be there, you know, they were born on third base and then they're happy about batting a triple. Yeah, exactly. Um, but let's talk about specific policy changes. What? Give me three specific policy changes that you would like to see in the criminal justice system. Three specific policy changes that I would like to see in the criminal justice system. Um, do you want attainable now or do you want like long term what we really ought to do? Uh, let's talk about uh, let's talk about what we ought to do. What we really ought to do is think real hard about how much money we want to spend housing and caging other human beings and what benefit that provides to all of us. So what I learned in law school was something that, that still sticks with me. The United States uses incarceration at a rate that's disproportionate to, I think, every other industrialized nation that's not China. And if you look at Western European nations, they also use incarceration for serious offenses. But they are much more likely to use things like restorative justice, to use uh, financial penalties that would go back to the victim or to cover the cost of the prosecution, community service, um, home detention, alternate sentence dispositions, lots of other things other than putting people in cages. And that decarceration of our society would be the biggest thing. And it's the hardest thing in the United States. So our, I assume you're familiar with the 13th Amendment, which prohibits slavery yep. or indentured servitude, except- As a prisoner. 
except on criminal conviction. Yeah. And that's why you have Angola prison camp in Louisiana, mm. where you still have slave labor, but it's not called slave labor because it fits within the new 13th Amendment. That, that incarceration model, the prison camp work camp model, the idea that it is just and right to take years out of people's lives and keep them alive in a cage, but not allow them to integrate into society is, frankly, it's a sickness in our national culture. That would be the biggest change you could make. The next biggest change you could make would be to make, um, and I wrote a paper about this at the Libertarian Policy Institute, uh, at libertarianpolicy.org, make policing into a profession. So the trades work on sort of a union model where everybody who works in the trade wants to have a minimum standard of acceptable workplace practices, so they unionize. And then that protects kind of the lowest level, right? You're, you're protecting the weakest link in solidarity. It's important for, you know, sort of traditional class politics. Professions are different. Professions are self-regulated. They're not regulated by the government. They're regulated by the people in them in order to make the profession better and protect the public so that the profession has some prestige. They're able to charge a premium for their services, etc. Doctors and lawyers are professions. And regardless of the jokes, if a lawyer misbehaves, there are a bunch of other lawyers ready and willing to take that lawyer's license and hold them up before the world as an example of the bad behavior with which we will not put up. That is not the case with police officers. Police officers operate on the union model. They're defending the least of them because it's all a solidarity thing about you know the blue line, et cetera. If you just shifted policing to be a profession where police were required to carry malpractice insurance, where your malpractice insurance was related to whether or not you and or your department had had a number of liability claims, you were required to be liable for misconduct on the job, then all of the incentives would shift. And all of these police officers, especially at the higher levels of the police agencies, would shift their focus from trying to protect bad behavior by lower level officers to trying to root out bad behavior by lower level officers because it brings the rest of them down. Exactly. That fundamental shift in both liability and responsibility would change the incentives in a way that the rest of police reform would kind of roll downhill from it, yeah. right? It's, it's starting the avalanche you let the avalanche just roll. It'll snowball. Um, yeah. so that's two. I don't know if I have a third one. Third fundamental thing that would change. It's got to be cash bail, probably, because it's the same kind of thing where there's an attachment to whether or not I've got money determines whether or not I'm yeah. dangerous to society. And there are a lot of rich people who are real dangerous, and there are a lot of poor people who ain't. Yeah. And that's just the way of the world. And the cash bail system is built off of a previous somewhat Calvinist model of people with means. That's an indication that they have status in society. Status in society is an indication that they must probably be good people because they're successful people. It's kind of a prosperity gospel deal. Yeah. Um, and like the prosperity gospel, it's false. Anyway, uh, so those are the three big ones that are you know, long-term would fix things. Yeah. And I, I completely agree. Uh, I, you know, I've always talked, been a big advocate of, of qualified immunity reform, uh, getting rid of it for not just police, but public officials. And uh, this week, uh, New Mexico is the first state to actually do that, which was awesome. Go home state. Um, but, you know, I always advocate for that and people will tell me, Oh, you know, you're going to lose all your police officers because they're, you know, it'll be too expensive to, to, to be a police officer. And it's, it gives you the incentive to not do the bad things or to protect the bad people within your force because generally malpractice insurance is based off of 
two things. One, the, the, you know, the group that you're associated with and then your own performance. And if uh, you're, also, if you, uh, there's a third. Oh, the, the, the difficulty of the task. Yes. So it's like um, with doctors, anesthesiologists pay higher malpractice than, say, a psychiatrist because Perfect. of the sorry, it's, it's not the difficulty. It's the it's the severity of the risk of a failure. Yes. Yes, exactly. So uh, it it gives the incentive to one, perform your job well and two, get the get rid of those people. Uh, you know, cops should be bonded and insured. And, uh, you know, if you do something wrong, you lose your bond, you have to pay your bond to begin, you know, once again, practice law. And it's funny because that's how policing works in affluent communities. Mm -hmm. And and I, I don't think we talk about this enough because it's probably seen as commonplace by people who live in those communities. But I'm going to tell you a story. Um, when I lived... Uh, in Colorado, I live south of Denver. I played on a lawyer's football team, two-hand shove, probably. Um, and I was late one Sunday morning, and I was driving out of my uh, suburban neighborhood south of Denver to get up to into Denver to get to the game. And a uh, nice RX-8, uh, or I liked it, and I was probably going faster than uh, was authorized by the law. And I got pulled over. And this police officer from Lone Tree, which was the jurisdiction right outside my neighborhood, um, pulled me over, asked for license and registration. Before I give it to him, I say, look, you know, officer, I've got a gun in the glove box. I'm letting you know that before I get my license and registration. He said, thank you for letting me know. I open the glove box. I take my nine millimeter handgun, um, which is racked, and set it on my seat. I hand him the registration and the insurance card. And then he takes those things and walks back to his car, leaving me sitting in my car with a loaded and ready to fire handgun on my seat. He then comes back, tells me I should really drive slower, sees that I live in the neighborhood, hands me his card. Unless I, I have any issues with the stop, I'm welcome to call into the local police station to ask any questions or provide any concerns, and I'm sent on my way. Now, in a different jurisdiction in Colorado, I would have been face down on the asphalt waiting for that traffic stop to resolve. Yeah. And if I was of a different complexion in Colorado, I might not be talking to you. Exactly. I mean, and we forget... <laughs> Case. what that means but in that high rent jurisdiction that officer is on his best behavior because those are the people who pay his salary and that chief will get rid of him if he turns out to be impolite or inconsiderate to people who live in the community that's the difference between policing that is integrated in the community and policing that is seen as an occupying force in the community, right? Yeah. Those officers who are in jurisdictions where they see themselves as antagonists really don't prioritize whether or not people have a good impression of them. And that is the fundamental disconnect. We need to get the incentives aligned so that the community is really responsible for how they are policed because they are paying to have themselves be policed. And that's one of the things I want to get back to is let's empower people who pay their taxes, who live in these communities to say, this is what I want law enforcement to look like where I live, where I pay for it. This is what I want. And if there are law enforcement officials or politicians who are unwilling to modify the system of government to match the people who are represented in government, then they need to find other jobs in the private sector. Yeah. Um, so this summer or the, this past summer, everything kind of blew up. Uh, and right now we're in the middle of the Derek Chauvin trial. How do you think that trial is going? Do you, do you think the prosecution is making a a good case at this point? 
I mean, I think they're doing pretty well. It sounds like they got flat footed by a couple of uh, defense cross examinations, but that happens. Prosecutors are prosecutors. You know, prosecutors tend to go in a little cocky mm-hmm. and defense attorneys tend to not go in cocky. And you get that differential just by how you sort of approach the thing. Um, I think they're doing fine. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of defense to that case. Yeah. Really, those attorneys are going to try and beat the top charge, maybe, you know, get some kind of mitigation evidence out. They're not going to be able to change cause of death. That's not going to go anywhere. There's no mental state you can really pull on Chauvin. Um, You know, the best you've got is sort of like the scene is hectic and maybe his training told him to do stuff like that, which are both. I mean, they're what you have to work with. If you're a defense attorney, you work with what you got. Sure. But I don't think that that if that trial goes to a full on acquittal, I will be surprised. Yeah, from what I gather of, of what I've seen of the the coverage so far is that it, it's looking pretty good for for at least conviction on some of the counts. Uh, now, if he gets beats the top charge, I don't know. I don't think it matters if he gets convicted of everything else and does some real time. Uh, I, I think the the city is going to explode again. Um, it might. I don't know. Um, it could. It, it really, it's going to depend on how people see it, right? Do they see it as something that that was the end of a fair process or do they see it as something that was baked in? Yeah. You know, like, what people really want in life, and you've probably seen this as state chair in West Virginia. I saw it as national chair. Judges taught it to me when I was practicing law. People want to be heard. They want to know that you heard them that you understand where they're coming from and that you've given their views and their desires the respect that they are due. They're less attached to the outcome if they feel heard. And if they don't feel heard, sometimes even the right outcome won't stop them from being upset. Sure. You know, how you do things is as important as what you do. And I think, With this trial, it seems like they're doing most of the things the right way. And I think that will probably lead to there being less chance of civil unrest or violence at the outcome of the trial. But there will always be people who want there to be. You know, there is a pretty strong element amongst white supremacists and the alt-right to try and make the unrest bigger than it is. Mm -hmm. Because by making the unrest be bigger than it is, you can avoid the conversation about the root causes of the unrest. Yeah. Um, Now, I'm trying to remember, you you went to, well, you went to Minneapolis after. I did, I went and marched in downtown. Yeah, Um, tell me about your experience. Month of month after, a few weeks after. Yeah, yeah. Tell me about your experience there. How, how you know? What did you see? What did you learn about the situation on the ground there? So, I learned a lot. Um, Minnesota nice is sort of a, a legend about how everyone's super polite in Minnesota, and they are until they're not. What Minnesota Nice tends to cover up is any sort of grievance that you have, you just carry it around tight inside your vest until you need to pull it out. Um, and what that results in is, you know, Minneapolis and the Twin Cities have had a lot of racially charged problems over decades, right? Mm-hmm. You have know, Orlando Castile, you have uh the young woman who got shot by the oh, officer gosh. in her car. Yeah. I do not remember her name. Um, I think that was St. Paul. Yeah, that so was Somali, oh. uh, an officer of Somali extraction. Yeah. I don't remember his name either. Well, um, he was like the only police officer to get convicted and put in jail for. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> that itself, it has kind of been noted yeah. by a lot of the Black Lives Matter people in Minneapolis. Yeah. that the only police officer who ever got convicted for killing somebody um, was 
black. Anyway, uh, so all that's been bubbling up under the surface for a long time. And I think just the sheer brutality of the Floyd killing, right? Nine minutes splayed out on the ground in front of a bunch of people without being any active threat to any officer. It was too much, right? In a way that Philando Castile, who is a licensed concealed carry owner, who told the officer, I have a gun, and then was shot for telling him, yeah, that was too much, but that wasn't so too much as this, right? This is so much. And it blew up. I mean, I walked past uh, police precincts that were literally barricaded with concrete barriers and expanding foam and razor wire because the police were afraid to come out into the community because the community was so angry. Yeah. And when I say the community was angry, you see marches and you see protests and stuff, but I saw little old white ladies from the Minneapolis suburbs chanting and walking next to me in like filling the streets of Minneapolis chanting, fuck 12, fuck 12 which 12 is the code for the police in Minnesota. There is a point that has been reached where there's a breakage and it has to be repaired and it can't be repaired in the way that it was previously built. Like that has, that ship has sailed for Minnesota and the twin cities. Yeah. Their policing cannot be put back to what it was before without the whole city burning down. Um, and, and to some extent, you know, if you look at Seattle and Portland, they're not quite there, but they're close, you know, and it's also unsurprising. Portland and Oregon was one of the last states that was settled by the KKK. It was one of only two states that had non-unanimous jury verdicts, which were designed explicitly to make sure that African Americans did not get fair trials in Louisiana and Oregon, mm -hmm. um, because th you could have a few African Americans on your jury and still convict somebody. You know that kind of systematic racism is not long for the world anymore, and yeah. that I think is a long term. It will be of benefit, even though short term it's been very upsetting to people and there's a lot of chaos involved and there's bad actors and all sorts of stuff. Although, you know, when we, when we think about it, we, we have now in the white house, the architect of the 1994 crime bill, you've got a also a former public defender for a very brief period of time. Yeah. For about a half hour. And then uh, Kamala Harris was, uh, you know, the, the top prosecutor, the attorney general of California. And, uh, you know, you know, benefited her career, benefited from the fact that she, you know, prosecuted these laws that we're right. talking about right now. Yeah. Uh, and, and we're not seeing much movement on the, the criminal justice front from from this group right now. And we're seeing in fact, other, you know, we're seeing it go the other way at this point. You know, the, the stuff that that they got so angry about Trump doing. They're they're quite okay with you know keeping kids in cages. They're quite okay with uh, you know uh, continuing to build the wall, which you know was was kind of kind of crazy. Uh, do you have much hope for this administration at all? I do. Um, so one of the things you have to understand is that Democrats in this country have been put in a double bind for a very long time, ever since the Southern strategy switch around the civil rights era. Mm -hmm. um, they've been put in this bind where if they aren't tough on crime, they're going to be pilloried for being soft on crime. But if they are tough on crime, they're going to be pilloried from inside their own coalition for being insensitive to the problems of the criminal justice system. And so there's not a lot of upside for a Democrat in mainstream politics to work on criminal justice reform because there's this constant flanking maneuver that's being done against them. And so I understand why 
the Biden of 94 pushed the crime bill. I mean, you also had, there was the, the gun bill at the same time. Yep. Like it was sort of an upswing for democratic politics and they were taking some swings at things they thought they could get. And the crime bill was kind of the other side of the coin for the gun control bill, right? We're gonna be tough on crime, but we're also gonna take some of your guns. There was some deals made between the Republicans and Democrats back then. Yeah. Similarly, Kamala Harris is an African-American prosecutor coming up in California. She's gonna get all of the critiques that she was gonna be soft on crime because of her background. And I saw this a lot with public defenders who became judges. You would think that public defenders who become judges would be sympathetic to defense arguments or constitutional arguments about individual rights. And oftentimes they would overcompensate because they would be so fearful of being seen that way that they would then turn on their former clients and colleagues. It's a human nature thing. Yeah. I think that in a Nixon goes to China kind of way, there are some really good possibilities for criminal justice reform from this administration. Because both you have two people who have previously built reputations as criminal justice hawks, mm -hmm. right? They're known for it. So them coming to reform has more ethos than someone who had always been a reformer, right? They they've been able to have a revelation, they've had a transformative experience that's brought them to this place. The other thing you have is just the last administration sucked. They were just absolute and utter garbage on all of these issues with the tiny little sliver of light of the First Step Act. And so with there being such a large vote for Biden that wasn't so much for Biden as against the previous occupant of the office, the guy, real estate developer from Queens, uh, kind of a jerk, tried to steal an old lady's house in Atlantic City, yeah. nothing else of note. Um, <laughs> anyway, that guy did so much bad stuff that there's an appetite now. And frankly, I think that that's the reason that we're seeing so much cannabis legalization happening within the first hundred days of the Biden administration. I think New York would have legalized a couple of years ago if there wasn't a Republican administration, a Republican DOJ. I think a lot of these places would have, but they didn't want to do it on a Republican president's watch. They didn't want to do it in a place where he was going to use it as a stick to hit them or their party. And now that you have a relatively boring old Democrat in office, the floodgates are open for you know, qualified immunity reform, bail reform, death penalty repeals, criminal justice reforms of all types, cannabis legalization, right? It's kind of a free for all. And I think we would do well as people who are not aligned with either of the parties to lean real hard into that aspect of the free for all and save our fire for things like the infrastructure plan, yeah. right? fight back against the goofy stuff that we would have fought if it was the other administration too, but let them have, you know, some of these immigration and criminal justice reform wins and really help them swing through the ball because people are people. And if you provide positive reinforcement for good behavior, yes, that usually leads to more good behavior. At least it does with my kids. Yeah. And, but I don't know. I mean, like what I'm seeing with the immigration reform with the with the Biden administration and my concern with the Biden administration is that they're kind of burning through because typically after a first term or in the middle of a first term, that first election, you're see, you'll see a swing back to the other party. The other party may still be distasteful, uh, but there's such uh, slim margins in both houses that all you need is one Republican pickup in the Senate. And all you need is, you know, uh, 10 pickups in the, in the, the House. And now you're dealing with, uh, you know, Republican Speaker and, uh, uh, you know, probably Mitch McConnell again. Uh, yeah, but that was the best part of my lifetime and probably yours was the time when we had a Democratic president with a Republican House and Senate. Just saying. True. But what will we get out of it? That, that's the thing. I, will we get will we get criminal justice reform then? Or if if they wait too long uh, and kind of burn through that, you know, triple Democratic 
uh, you know, House, Senate, and, and presidency. Uh, it, will we get that, or will it? You know, I, I don't not like obstruction, but you know, if we get to that point where we got Democratic president and House and Senate in Republican hands, will we see those reforms? So look at it this way. You don't know the answer to your question. Your question is inscrutable. Yep. But we do know that let's say that the Biden administration wants to get some action that's notable on gun control and some action that's notable on criminal justice reform or immigration reform. Yes. They probably only have the political capital to do one or the other. So what should we be doing to encourage them that in that first term, when they've got all three houses or the two houses in the presidency, should we be encouraging them to work on the thing that we really want them to win on? And maybe they can put off gun control for, I don't know, after the midterms. Yeah. That'd be a good time to work on that priority exactly. later. So I think we need to, to think of, we need to think strategically about what power does approval have, not just think about what power criticism has. Okay. And kind of target what we're pushing on. You know, uh, Bill Weld, uh, just to bring up a favorite libertarian of yours, uh, <laughs> used to say that being a Republican governor in Massachusetts was like uh, paddling a canoe upstream in which you can't really get speed, but at best you can move it one way or the other, right? You can change direction a little bit and that's important too. Yeah. And we have to look at ourselves as libertarians, you know, with some amount of realism, we may be on the upswing, but there's a limit to how much we can actually do and how much energy we have. And we should probably push hard on applauding things like repealing the Muslim ban. Yes. And be disappointed, publicly disappointed with not fixing things about, you know, minor detention. Yeah. But don't continue to behave as though we're still in an election. And that's what I've noticed that's really frustrating is there's a lot of people spreading things about Biden or Harris that are the kind of material that is designed to stop you from voting for them. But right. you're not gonna have a chance to do that for another three and a half years. So maybe let's kind of focus on what they're doing now instead of, you know, that guy's senile or, you yeah. know, she was a terrible drug warrior. It's like, yeah, but now they're in charge. So let's look at what they're doing now and not keep going back to campaign ads about, you know, some stuff that's really just designed to make you think that they're worse than the person they're running against. They're not running against anyone now. So what's the point of that unless you're a Republican? If you're a Republican, I totally get it. But yeah. Republicans don't really have anything to talk about anyway. So let's not fall into their little trap. Let's let them live in their little puddle and, you know, splash each other. Yeah. And, you know, I think the big thing for us to gain influence is more on the idea of coalition building and, and learning how to pick those things where, you know, the party in power is, is good because the party in power may, you know, as Democrats may be good on, on criminal justice or maybe good on ending the drug war and things like that. Those are things we should be working with them on. Uh, the, you know, when the Republicans are in office, let's, you know, get some, start working on fiscal policy and things like that. Um, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, sorry. 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 Yeah. <laughs> sorry. You know, Go ahead. Some, continue. Oh, wait, maybe go guns. Oh, no, no, yeah. no, no. It's hard. Yeah. Because uh, neither, neither side is, has been really good about the things that they purportedly support. But right. again, I, get, I see your point talking about encourage the, encouraging them to do the good thing uh, and yeah. giving them support when they do. Um, you know, uh, in our, our uh, last couple of minutes together, um, I wanted to talk about the Libertarian Policy Institute. Uh, tell me what's going on with that. Um, how is that going? And, and uh, what are you guys up to? 
So the Libertarian Policy Institute is designed to provide solutions to the problems that people have in their lives. Um, you know, rather than approaching libertarianism from the perspective of, hey, here's something that's very important to me, I'm going to go tell all my friends why it should be important to them until they eventually get bored of me lecturing them. We want to come from the other side and say, you know, people have problems with too many law enforcement officers shooting too many people of color or problems with how higher education is funded and people feeling like they're drowning under student debt. And then approaching those problems that are widely agreed to be problems with solutions that don't add any coercion to the system. You know, we want solutions that are more persuasion and less coercion, more individual empowerment and less government empowerment. And, you know, I, ideally ones in which we can realign the incentives so that the systems are kind of self-correcting in a way checks and balances are supposed to work. Where, you know, let's say for example, that you make the drinking age be the same as the enlistment age for the military. Well, now you have two large power brokers in politics who have incentives to try and move that number around. Yeah. And I don't know where that number will come out if you align those two things, but I know that two other groups that are very busy would figure out where it should be and we wouldn't have to work on it. And it's that kind of elegant solution that LPI wants to do. We wanna focus on collaborating with anyone who will help us move towards a better world in a peaceful way without um, you know, adding government force into the equation and kind of develop this idea of a collaborative libertarianism or collaboritarianism where we will work with anyone to do right and with no one to do wrong like Fred Frederick Douglass talked about. Yes. That's the idea, um, kind of transcending partisanship a little bit and looking to focus on shared work. You know, what are we working on together to make our community better? Rather than the fighting that has traditionally both uh, been part of libertarian politics, but also just politics generally. It's a lot of fighting. It's a lot of that guy is worse than this guy. You know, I'm not so great, but he's a jerk. So vote for me instead. I want to move past that. And I want to move towards, you know, Nick and David both live in the same town and want to deal with the homeless crisis. So we're going to build some new housing so people actually can have a place to live. And then we'll go back to fighting about hockey teams after, exactly. but not during. Right. <laughs> Well, Nick, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I really appreciate it. We probably could have done like two or three hours of this show. Uh, Easily. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a great topic and you're a fantastic mind, one of the best minds in the libertarian movement. Um, I really appreciate you joining us tonight. Uh, and uh, I really like working with your wife. She's great on the LNC. So. Well, uh, she's the better Sarwark, everyone knows. <laughs> but uh, thanks everyone for joining us on uh, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch. Uh, and uh, we will uh, talk to everyone next week. Uh, the topic is still to be determined. I think it's going to be Steve Sheets, though. So, um, But uh, anyway, uh, join us on the Political Deep Dive After Dark show. Uh, we'll continue the conversation about the week in politics, and I will see everyone. Let me get everything in order here. I'll see everyone next week. Thank you again, Nick, and you have a great night. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on the Political Deep Dive. We air every Sunday night at 8 p.m. on Twitter, YouTube, and Twitch. Thanks to People for Liberty for airing this episode on their Facebook page at People the Number Four Liberty Inc. You can find me on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter with the handle of Papa Duke, P A P A D U K E. Our Facebook page is the Political Deep Dive Podcast, all one word. Our Twitch handle is DT Valente, D T V A L E N T E. And our SoundCloud is The Political Deep Dive, all one word. We will see you next Sunday night at 8 p.m.